without further ado, I wanted to welcome you to today's topic. And this is a topic that I myself am very passionate about. It's yoga and dance. And you might have sort of noticed that there's a lot of, um, well, frankly, there's a lot of dancers and a lot of movement artists in general that often find yoga as a helpful addition to their creative pursuits. Hence our name here for this title, this lecture, Yoga and Dance, Attuning to the Self Through Creative Movement. We have today actually two dancers um, and we're coming from different parts of the world and I just want to go ahead and introduce them. First we have Ishwarya Chaitanya. Ishwarya, want to just give a little wave so they know which one you are? Thanks Ishwarya. Ishwarya is joining us from Bangalore, India. And Ishwarya is a trained Bharatanatyam dancer and Bharatanatyam is a very classical dance from India. She's, all, she's not only a Bharatanatyam dancer, she's also a yoga teacher and a yoga therapist. Ishwari is actually originally from Vancouver, British Columbia, but she moved to India to pursue her passion for dance and Indian culture in its most traditional setting. Now she pursued her advanced dance training in something called Abhinaya, which is the art of expression. And she did that with the renowned dancers Guru B. Bhanumati and another dancers Guru Sheila Chandrasekhar. And she's performed all over India with her dance troupe. She also completed her master's in dance with Shastra University, Tanjavur, under the guidance of legendary Dr. Padma Subramanian. And she also has a postgraduate diploma in yoga therapy from S. Vyasa University. As well, um, she has a BS uh, in science from University of British Columbia. She's a student of Swami Dayananda Saraswati, who is a renowned teacher of Vedanta. If you remember Vedanta, that's the study of the, of the Vedas or the Upanishads that we talked about in the first, um, the first lecture, the philosophical parts of um, the Vedas that, that we were describing. And Ishwari actually spent a large part of four years in his Gurukalam, which is a traditional school, being exposed to the traditional teachings of Vedanta. Ishwari now performs as a freelance artist, and she also conducts yoga classes through her school, the Kula House of Yoga. Then we have Varsha. Varsha, you want to give a little wave here so they can see which one you are? Perfect. Thank you. Varsha is joining us from Dubai in um, the United Arab Emirates. Now, Varsha graduated in interior design from Harriet Watt University in Dubai. And having worked in a corporate firm for a couple of years, she then embarked on an inner journey to realize that her passion in life was towards the well being of herself and her fellow human beings. And this actually made her pursue her passion in life, which was dance, which she's been learning since she was six years old. Varsha is trained in Bharatanatyam. Latin dances, hip hop, and then eventually landed herself as a contemporary dancer. Now, since shifting to working and training full-time in dance, Varsha was, has also been exploring other various dimensions of dance and movement, including yoga. In 2019, she graduated from the Atakalari Center of Movement Arts and Mixed Media, which is in Bangalore, India. And with the, with the experience that she gained, she developed a movement training discipline of her own, which is called Cat Flow which is a combination of movement and yoga for greater well-being. Her happiness comes from sharing this knowledge with her students and seeing them more relaxed and balanced in life. Now, without further ado, I'm going to give this over to Varsha and Ishwarya to talk about some of the um, things that they've known, they've studied, they've read, and they've experienced with yoga and dance. Thank you so much, uh, Priya, for your wonderful introduction. Um, it's been quite a journey to uh, put together the material to present today because it basically combines all of our interests in, in uh, one place. Attuning to the self through creative movement is the topic uh, that has been given to us today. And this title has a few parts. One is the self, the other is creative movement, and the third aspect is attuning to. So therefore it um, is, is a topic which explores three different 
aspects which need to be combined in a particular way uh, with respect to yoga and dance and spirituality. So we've given the sub subheading, the confluence of yoga, dance, and the spiritual pursuit. According to our Indian scriptures, human endeavor has been placed into four categories known as the purusharthas, which basically means that which is sought after by humans. The first thing we generally seek is a sense of security. So we work to acquire different types of wealth, uh, a roof over our head, food on the table, clothing, and basically we need all, our, all of our basic needs met in order for us to be able to survive and live um, a particular lifestyle, a very basic lifestyle. Once our basic needs have been met, uh, we now have the freedom to pursue things which are not necessarily uh, needed for our survival, but uh, they are things that we want. And so this pursuit is known as Kama. And we generally seek what gives us pleasure and avoid things that give us displeasure. And as what we like and dislike is subject to change and constant uh, fluctuation, satisfying desire ends up becoming a, a, a real struggle over time. But it is still something uh, that we do pursue. Now, all of this, uh, you know, we cannot live by our whims and fancies and our changing likes and dislikes. So for human society to function, we need a set of standards that is independent of the individual subjective values. And it is something that should be universal and common sense based, based on common sense. And this is what is called dharma. And to lead a dharmic life is to be in line with oneself and to live in harmony with the rest of creation. And finally, uh, very few end up um, in this final pursuit, and that is the pursuit of freedom, um, the pursuit of liberation, the pursuit of some may call it salvation. And very few actually take to this pursuit, but it is the underlying current of every pursuit of every individual. One of the Upanishads, as, um, but, uh, as Priya mentioned earlier, Upanishad is the study of basically uh, the nature of reality or the nature of truth. And uh, this is a part of the study of Veda. So Katopanishad, one of the Upanishads, describes human life as a journey to reach the limitless. And here we have already identified um, this as the self, according to the title of our presentation today. And all of the necessary equipment has been provided uh, by nature, by creation, in order for us to be able to achieve this. So um, here there is a picture of uh, a very famous picture, which is usually gracing the covers of all the uh, Bhagavad Gita uh, books. And it has a chariot, it has horses, it has a charioteer, it has a warrior, and one who controls the, chari uh, the horses through reins. So this is a very symbolic uh, image. The chariot here represents the body. The horses represent our sense organs. The reins controlling the horses represent uh, the mind and the one who holds the reins and directs the horses is the intellect. So the intellect is in control of the mind and the mind is in control of our sense organs. And we use all of these facilities in order to navigate through life and achieve the goals that we set out for ourselves. So today we have already identified that the goal we are in uh, search of 
is the self. And self-knowledge is a highly explored topic and uh, it is something which is traditionally studied with a guru who comes or, or uh, a teacher who comes from a certain um, teaching tradition. So let us explore if movement can actually lead us to uh, understanding the self. You know, this is a topic that is very well explored, analyzed, and commented upon numerous, numerous times. And every, uh, every aspect of it is broken down. So here is, when we are talking specifically about self-knowledge, there will be certain vocabularies that are used. So, so the self-knowledge being the goal is, is called sadhya, that which we are trying to achieve. Um, the means through which we want to achieve it is called sadhana. The one who performs the sadhana, who is, who is searching, who is seeking to um, fulfill the goal, is known as the sadhaka. And all of us are sadhakas in our own right. And finally, the one who has accomplished this end is a siddha. So generally, uh, when, it, when it comes to a guru, a guru is one who is already a siddha. He is already one who has achieved uh, the end which he was seeking. And that's what makes him uh, qualified to be a guru to now bring up the next person in line. So life can be seen as a series of goals to be achieved and a series of means employed in order to achieve these goals. And normally these goals are something other than oneself. So it is the acquisition of wealth or fame or children or a life partner or whatever it could be. And all of these achievements, uh, you know, once you achieve one thing, then you move on to the next thing, and then you move on to the next thing. And it becomes this endless sort of um, journey towards fulfilling our goals, and the desires are never ending until life itself comes to an end, and you feel, oh my gosh, I still, uh, I still have more that I would like to do. But here uh, in our topic and in, in this entire uh, um, program, we have identified that there is a particular goal that is superior to all other goals. Something which ends the pursuit of goal seeking itself, something which ends the, um, uh, the desire from even arising. And this is the only end, this is the only goal which can be achieved without incurring any loss. And this is something which results, uh, I think, I'm sure you would have uh, had the exposure earlier. So Shastra always describes this end, this Purushartha of Moksha or this Purushartha towards freedom. Freedom is wholeness, freedom is completeness. It is total independence and it is the removal of the cause of sadness. Um, it is the essence of the word being. So this is something that is arrived at through various uh, means through the study of self-knowledge. So once we identify the end, that this is what we are wanting to achieve. There is this elusive thing uh, that exists in this world where we, uh, where we can experience wholeness, we can experience fullness. This is what I want. This is what I am right now. I am, I am sad, I am lonely, I feel limited, I have frustration and I'm not, I, I don't feel complete within myself and I'm always seeking something. And then there is, there is this teaching which tells you that you are that which you seek, you are that wholeness and you are that completeness. And so now bridging the gap between what we are at present and what we want to be becomes a bit easier because everything we pursue now is going to be linked towards that end. So this is why even um, Lord Krishna when he gives the Bhagavad Gita or when he uh, does the, um, uh, when he teaches the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna, the warrior, in the middle of the battlefield, he tells him the end right at the beginning. 
in, in the second chapter itself. Arjuna is uh, wondering how he's going to continue with, with this battle when uh, he is unable to kind of come to grips with what it means. So Krishna tells him, do not fear. He says, Najayate mriyate vakada chittanayam bhutva bhavitavana bhuyaha ajonityam shashvatoyam puranaha nahanyate hanyamane sharire. So he gives the, the nature of what it is, he, what is it that you think you are going to destroy? This self is never born, nor does it ever die. It doesn't have to come into existence, nor will it cease to be. It is birthless, eternal, undecaying, ancient. It is not destroyed when the body is destroyed. These statements are known as Mahavakya. And um, Mahavakya is, is this statement uh, which, re, which, re, with, sorry, which tells us what the nature of the self is. And the interesting thing about the Mahavakya, the very definition of the word, is that uh, it is something which can neither be proven nor can it be negated by any means of knowledge. Um, but this is what would be the most useful for the person who, is, who has started on this inquiry, in this path of inquiry. So different Upanishads uh, have expressed the same Mahavakya in, in different, different ways. So there is Ishavasya Upanishad, Chandogya, Mandukya, Aitriya, Taitriya, Brahadaranyaka. There are so many Upanishads and all of them um, have the same statement, but all of them give a, a different teaching. Uh, it's the same teaching, but in a slightly different manner. So all of these have to be handled by somebody who is well-versed. And the very definition of guru is someone who is shrotriyam and brahmanishtha. So shrotriya is one who is well-versed in the shastra, uh, one who has undergone the very intense and um, very you know, demanding uh, study, which takes place over so many years. And not only is, but he is not limited to being a scholar. He isn't somebody, a guru is not someone who can just quote like this at the tip of his fingers. So he is not merely a scholar, but he is also a Brahmanishta. He is one who is established in the knowledge that he is speaking. So practice what you preach, but it is, it is not just someone who practices, but somebody who lives it. And so um, finding a, a, a proper guru, you know, uh, a lot, there are a lot of self-proclaimed gurus, but finding a proper guru comes to one who is very clear uh, in what they are seeking. So the clearer you are, the higher the chances that uh, you will come across somebody who will be able to take you where you want to go. So if self-knowledge, as the word implies, is centered on myself, and I am the very object that I seek, um, then it must be very simple. It's, it's all about me. Well, it is and it isn't. To arrive at oneself as wholeness, as completeness, um, is not everybody's cup of tea. So for example, uh, somebody wants to become a doctor. So without having gone through med school, you cannot really uh, call yourself a doctor. So you need to have certain qualifications. You need to have certain training and, certain, and a certain background to be, and a certain degree to be able to call yourself a doctor. And uh, to be a doctor of repute, it's better if you would have um, studied at a reputable institution. So this, is, this, is, this pursuit is just like that sort of a pursuit. One needs to have um, certain qualifications and even these qualifications are given by Shastra itself. So Shastra lists fourfold qualifications for self-inquiry. The first is Viveka or discriminative <laughs> Ishwari, yeah. yeah, I'm just going to pause yeah. you for a second, only because I think this question that came up is relevant now. Okay. Somebody just asked, is a guru always a man? As some of the pictures I think showed a man, we often hear that as a man. And so I just wanted you to address that now before we went on further. 
Oh yeah, no, no, Guru uh, ha has nothing to do with um, gender. So there are many female gurus as well, uh, Gargi, Maitri. I mean, there are so many that are listed in the scripture itself. Um, you know, there. So this male dominance thing is is not relevant here because self knowledge is not something that is uh, the privilege of a particular gender or a particular sex. It is for anyone who has a brain. So uh, a woman can be your guru as well. So it is not. It's not gender based. It's knowledge based, and knowledge does not see gender. So I hope that I hope thank that you. answers that. Yeah, thank you. So now I'll continue with the presentation. So the fourfold qualifications for self inquiry, the first being Viveka or the discriminative understanding. This is the definition that has been given. I'm not going to go too much into uh, the first, uh, the first two and the last one, but just to give an idea. So what is uh, understanding between what is timeless and what is time bound? So basically, um, you know, the sort of pattern of someone who comes into this, this sort of a thing is, uh, I, have seen, I have seen the world, I have accomplished a lot, I have a lot of wealth and I have a lot of things and I have a good job, I have a good house, I have a good family but I'm still not happy. So this is where Viveka happens in, in a person, you know, where, where even if they have achieved, they still, they, there's still something lacking. So now they start to question what is the purpose of life? And uh, that's how uh, one of the Upanishad actually starts. And that's how one starts their journey of seeking. And hopefully your journey leads you to somebody who will be able to answer those questions. The second qualification a person needs, uh, which is quite important, is vairagya. Um, raga is likes. So vairagya, viragaha, is the absence of desire for enjoyments present in this world and other worlds. Uh, it is a dispassionate outlook towards pleasure. So basically, you are no longer bound. And it's not something that uh, vairagya is not something where you give up. I'm going to give up eating chocolate, I'm going to give up, uh, you know, whatever, I, I, I'm just, I'm going to give up buying stuff. So it's not something which comes from force. It is something which comes out of maturity. So, you know, I no longer need a teddy bear to go to sleep like I did when I was five. So that's an outcome of maturity. So that's the same thing with Vairagya. The next, Shamadi Shatka Sampatihi, I will elaborate on that. And finally, the last qualification is mumukshutvam, is the intense desire. So if you don't have a desire for liberation, it's not going to happen. And so that's why it's not everybody's cup of tea, because so many people will, are just looking to, you know, um, satisfy their basic needs. They don't have the luxury or the privilege, the time and the wealth to be able to sit and contemplate about what is the meaning of life. So it is a highly, it is a pursuit of somebody who, uh, you know, is quite well set, or it is the pursuit. Uh, it's not that somebody has to be rich uh, in order to be pursuing self-knowledge, but they need to have the liberty and the freedom to be able to do so. So now I will elaborate on the Shetka um, Sampatihi, which is what brings in the uh, aspect of dance and yoga. So these are sixfold uh, wealth that is acquired and which is necessary for somebody for self knowledge to dawn on that person. The first is the mastery over the mind. And I don't think um, anyone like has this better than a yogi or a dance practitioner, particularly in classical dance where the mind is completely engaged and completely in a, in a focused and with all distractions kept at bay because of the um, intense need and the passion to do well on stage. So shama is something which a lot of dancers have as part of the training to be a dancer. So it's not, you cannot 
um, feel, oh, I'm too lazy. Oh, I'm sore. Today, I, I can't practice. So these things, uh, we don't have, we don't have space for that. And uh, over time, we learn to live with pain. We we're no longer bound by physical pain, even if it's there. So we automatically through training gain this mastery. The next is dhamma, mastery over the sense organs. So today I really wanna eat chocolate cake or I really love the smell. Oh my God, the smell of pollution. It smells like urine in this green room. You know, all of these things are, um, uh, we, there's no place, there's no place for that. And uh, it's something we learn, we learn to live with a lot of things. Uh, we learn to live in a lot of discomfort and we find peace and happiness irrespective of the outer surroundings. Uparama, uparamati, introspectiveness, um, withdrawal from all other activities. So basically when you are a classical dancer and a yoga practitioner, the uh, art form, uh, both yoga and dance naturally lead a person to be more meditative and more introspective. It is just the nature of the practice. So almost everyone who practices yoga, even if they start um, at a very physical level with just an asana pranayama practice, there is something about that practice um, which just regulates all the hormones and everything and just makes us um, feel very calm and intuitive and clear. So this is one of the qualifications we need. The next, titiksha, forbearance, mental toughness uh, to withstand all challenges and inner strength. So this is also something uh, that a classical dancer uh, kind of excels in because there are so many challenges in order to, um, to perform, in order to one, if you're gonna put up your own show or two, even dance at a festival or a program that has been organized by somebody else. So particularly when it's organized by someone else, there are a lot of variables especially in India, that uh, you're just not going to know. So, you know, one example I'll give is we had a show in this, in this really small village. And, uh, you know, they, it was the end of their, uh, they did the Satyanara and Vrata. It's this big uh, sort of ritual that's done. And we were called for the last day of the show. And village people, uh, generally, the heart, their heart is really big. Um, <laughs> really big hearts and really wonderful hospitality and everything but but the stage was just a bunch of wooden planks which hadn't even been sort of uh, nailed down and there was the carpet that's just spread on top of this and so as we are stamping our feet uh, which is typical in classical dance our foot is going in between the planks <laughs> But this is not something we can really complain about uh, because we've we've just been shown so much love and we're six dancers like dancing on the stage that's like dancing as we're dancing. So it's just something which uh, which happens um, and we get through it and then we're better for it. I, I've also danced on a stage which was on the water. And it's and so the stage is already kind of like like floating in the water. And then it started raining. So now it's slippery and the stage is moving. So there are all kinds of like amazing experiences um, that we have as classical dancers. And, uh, you know, we're very privileged for it, but it helps us to gain the stitiksha. The next, shraddha, open mindedness and surrender and trust to the words of the teacher, the scriptures, and above all, an absence of intellectual arrogance. So basically a lot of the statements, you know, tatvamasi, aham brahmasmi, oh, I am that Brahman, how can it be so, I don't believe in this. You know, nobody is asking you to believe in this. So nothing in the Vedic scripture ever demands belief, blind belief. And uh, if someone takes the trouble to go through the study, you know, without uh, first judging it, a lot of times it's judged before any sort of uh, research or inquiry is even done. So Shraddha, one who has an attitude where there is an open-mindedness that, okay, I may not understand the statement at this time, 
but maybe clarity will come later on. So it is not, let me believe in the totality of the statement without using my own intellect. It is not that. It is, let me be open-minded to the truth of the statement and then see if it becomes clear later on. So Shraddha. And this open-mindedness uh, really helps us to kind of embrace a lot of things um, which we otherwise would be very sort of walled up against. And that helps us um, in various ways. And lastly, samadhanam, concentration, the capacity to focus. So yoga, meditation, dance, all of these uh, are innately built, you know, to give us this shamadhi shakta sampattihi and uh, help us in this journey, even if this journey is not one that we are, we are necessarily wanting to take, but it gives us all the tools. The next is dance and yoga as an upasana. So sadhana was a word that was used in the beginning as a means. Here, the word upasana is used because um, upasana denotes a certain discipline or a practice. It is also a means, but upasana is not necessarily for self-knowledge. So it is, it is a means and it is a discipline that is, um, uh, that, that is undertaken. So the first thing is this dance upasana, yoga upasana conditions us in three ways. The first is the conditioning of the physical body. The Natya Shastra, you know, basically breaks down the entire body into three points three parts, anga, upanga, and pratyanga. And all of these body parts are systematically trained through various exercises. So before you even learn to dance, you learn to train your entire physical body. And once you have trained the entire body, then we start exploring various movements of the legs on the ground and off the ground. So all of the movements like, um, you know, running and jumping and splits in ballet, even those movements are included in the Natya Shastra. Then you uh, have the sure, movement. Yeah. yeah. You want to just give a, a quick, um, just reintroduction to what the Natya Shastra is? Oh, yes, yes. Sorry. Yeah. So Natya Shastra is, uh, so how we have Veda, uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, this vast body of knowledge and the Upanishad. So the subject matter of the Veda and Upanishad was, was pretty restricted. So only those who are really in pursuit of it really uh, had a chance to learn it. So the Devas one day went to Lord Brahma and said, we need something, uh, you know, there's too much greed, there's too much anger and frustration and people are just, uh, you know, doing really bad things and we need to elevate the consciousness of the people. And we need something which has the message of the Shastra, but is also fun and engaging. And it should be an audio visual form of entertainment, which uh, allows us to learn as well as elevate our spirits. And so that's how Lord Brahma created the Natya Shastra, taking various elements from all the four Vedas. And then he made it open to all of the, all of the um, sort of beings. So Natya Shastra contains all the messages of the Veda, but it's fun and it's uh, beautiful. So that's the Natya Shastra. And it's considered the oldest text on dance and drama. And basically it's, it's around 6,000 verses, 36 chapters long. And they say there is no knowledge, no art, no um, nothing in this world that is not contained in the Natya Shastra. So it's, you know, this is a very small part, this Anga Upanga training of the body, but it also talks about uh, ev everything to do with drama. So you know, uh, poetry, prose, um, different types of meters, different types of characters, different how to build a green room, uh, the different types of stages, different types of costumes, arts, crafts, different instruments, wind instruments, string instruments, different types of melodies, basically music, dance, uh, script writing, everything, all elements, the stage, uh, everything is included in this one giant uh, text. 
So this study uh, is very elaborate. <laughs> So yoga as well, of course, as we know, the asana practice uh, also gives us this um, conditioning of the physical body. So asana is that which can be held with ease, poise for a length of time. So if we're constantly fidgeting or uh, focusing too much you know, on the breathing, you, you haven't yet achieved the asana. The next is conditioning at the verbal level. So conditioning at the verbal level is something which is uh, very important because, um, you know, as you think, so you speak in general, and uh, your speech is a, ref uh, is a reflection of your thought. So if the speech is unrefined, that means that the thought process is, um, is also running along the same lines. So a lot of uh, emphasis is given on speech and, and grammar. And, um, you know, one very, um, and basically speech is another mode of communication. So we communicate through our bodies, we communicate through speech. And uh, all these things for one who is in pursuit of the self has to come under the purview of ahimsa or nonviolence. So we have to be very cautious and aware of each and every word that we speak that it should not harm another being uh, or another person. I have just included a, a small sloka which I learned, which I really, really liked. Um, it's something that I, uh, if ever I have to give a, speak, a speech or something, I always just say it. So this is a, a prayer to the goddess Saraswati, who is considered the goddess of knowledge. So it goes like this. Ya varna padavakyartha gadya padya swarupini vachi nartayatu kshipram medham devi saraswati. So this includes uh, the word dance, you know, nartayatu. So that's why I also like it. So ya varna padavakyartha, the one who is in of letter, the alphabet, um, pada, word, and vakyartha, the meaning of the sentence. Gadya Padya, so who is in the form of prose and poetry. May you dance on my tongue um, with intellect and understanding so that what I speak is in, in line with, with this goddess Saraswati. So that was uh, written by Shankaracharya and I've included his uh, picture here. In the olden days, they used to have something called uh, sadas, vidvat sadas. So that is a gathering of scholars and uh, they will you know, conduct uh, large debates. So one of the Shankaracharyas has a sidebar, has actually mentioned how Russia was called Rishi Varsha or the uh, abode of Rishis or these exalted, very wise, knowledgeable sages. And large uh, Vidvat Sadas used to uh, take place in that region. So um, here we have Shankaracharya debating with Mandana Mishra. And overseeing the debate, someone was mentioning, are all the gurus only men? So overseeing this debate as an impartial judge is Mandana Mishra's wife, Ubaya Bharati. And both Shankaracharya and Mandana Mishra were really, really great uh, scholars in their own right. So uh, there wasn't anyone qualified who was gonna be able to sort of see who has won the debate because um, it's, it was very difficult to surpass their knowledge. So Ubaya Bharati um, very cleverly uh, said, okay, both of them have to wear a mala, a jasmine garland. And looking at the freshness of the mala will show who has won the debate because that person has more clarity um, on the topic. Because when you don't have clarity and you start getting into confusion, uh, you start to perspire and your persp the perspiration would you know, um, cause the mala to kind of disintegrate. So this, is, uh, this was a very grand debate and the subject of you know, various um, books have been written on this. So yes, uh, verbal conditioning. So in Vedanta, it is there. In yoga, it is there. In yoga, generally, we remain silent in our practice. The Natya Shastra also, this is there because um, 
basically it is an upaveda so it contains everything um, one would need to be become a refined speech and finally mental conditioning manasika karma so uh, one of the most you know practical methodical and systematic programs for mental conditioning available is the Patanjali Yoga Sutras. And um, Patanjali was a very great sage who has written works on three very uh, distinct areas of knowledge. So, which is grammar, yoga, and Ayurveda. So there is an opening prayer itself, which we chant usually in the beginning of the yoga class. Yogena chittasya padena vacham malam sharirasya chavaidya kena. So um, yoga is for chitta, the mind, first. Padena vacham, for speech and grammar. And finally, malam sharirasya, any disease or uh, any discomfort, disease or you know, impurity in the body. It is a vaidya, it is a medicine. So Yoga is a medicine and yoga is that which purifies our mind, our speech, our intellect and our bodies. And the Patanjali Yoga Sutras uh, are a wonderful thing to study for anyone who gets an opportunity um, because it goes through very, very elaborately what is the mind and uh, what is it that needs to be done with it. And Natya Shastra, um, having the nature of being a drama, basically has a very in-depth analysis of emotions, their origin and their expression. So we are constantly trying to um, look at the world. The Natya Shastra takes the entire world as inspiration and everything which goes on in this world is depicted in Natya. And uh, we experience highs and lows of emotion. And it's one thing to experience it in real life. And it's another thing to be able to convincingly bring it into a performance. And uh, this is something which is explored very highly in the Natya Shastra. So finally, once the Kaya, Vacha and Manasa, the body, the, the speech, the thought process and the mind are uh, sort of in line, this creates a person who is very integrated. And an integrated person who is not bound by conflicting desires or a confused mind is somebody who is, more, who is going to be more qualified to be a recipient of this uh, knowledge of the self, which will elevate him even further. And Natya brings this about and yoga brings this about in the most profound way because in, an artist has to have this unity in order to be able to lay himself bare on stage. And he is fully rehearsed and yet he is completely vulnerable to the moment and open to the possibilities of what will happen at the moment. The artist is fully clothed and yet completely naked in front of the audience and fully in tune with uh, the truth of the performance. So with this, I want to show a small clip of my dance teacher, Guru B. Bhanumati, who basically imbibes all of the qualities uh, that I have spoken about. And in this, she uh, is performing Krishna and uh, Krishna is a small child and he comes to, uh, you know, he sneaks into this, the house of this, uh, this couple late in the night and the woman and the man, the husband and wife are sleeping next to each other. And the man has a really long beard and the, and the woman has really long hair. So he's always up to mischief. So he ties the hair and the beard together and then knocks on the door. And when they wake up, you know, they're startled and they pull at each other's uh, hair and, and uh, well, what, what happened? So this is a small clip of Guru B. Bhanumati. There's no one for him to play with, so he's trying to decide what mischief can I get up to on my own. <laughs> Thank you. 
a little bit. Mm -hmm. You went and had the entire thing. Mm -hmm. Please, please, Mama, please don't bring the boogie monster. I don't want to go. I don't want to go there. And, and the entire piece uh, kind of gets goes along those lines. Uh, the, the last uh, video that I wanted to show is very rarely do we get to see nowadays, um, you know, the elements of Natya Shastra with respect to costume and musical arrangement, etc., in the full extent. So this was a production that was done in Bangalore. Uh, which which shows episodes from the Srimad Bhagavatam. So here you will see uh, the the marriage of Lord Krishna's mother and father Devaki and Vasudeva, and how uh, Kamsa, her brother or the king of the time, then takes them on a procession throughout the town. This is Devaki and Vasudeva. And he's tying the uh, Mangal Sutra. They're walking around the flame. Now there's usually a ritual where the husband and wife will uh, we'll sit on a swing, <laughs> part of the wedding rites. Now Kamsa has arrived. He's very proud and happy about his sister's marriage. And the same dancers who were the swing have now become the, um, the musicians and dancers who are part of the profession. Takes her to a nearby temple, get blessed by the The song is describing all of the instruments and the grandness of the profession. With that, um, I conclude my presentation for now. And I would like to hand it over to Varsha uh, to give us her insights on the real world application of yoga in the performative experience uh, with respect to contemporary dance. Varsha. Hi everyone, I hope um, you can hear me. Thank you so much, Aishwarya. Um, so she beautifully took us into the depth of the topic. And now I'm kind of gonna bring it a bit to the surface and um, talk about a more practical approach to attuning the self through yoga in respect to contemporary dance. So I'll be going into the influence of yoga in contemporary dance. So what is contemporary dance? In the, around the 1980s, contemporary dance referred to the movement of new dancers who didn't want to follow strict classical ballet and lyrical dance forms, but instead wanted to explore an area of revolutionary unconventional movements that were gathered from all dance styles around the world. And in order to understand the history of it, we need to take a look at some of the notable pioneers of contemporary dance who were the instrument in developing what is known as contemporary dance today. Isadora Duncan, she started off as an American ballet dancer, 
However, in the early 1900s, she rejected the classical techniques and the rigid trainings that she went through in order to embrace the human body's natural lines and energy. In doing, in doing so, she aimed to create a dance style with more fluid dance movement and emotional resonance. Other renowned dancers and choreographers quickly followed her lead, with each one responsible for innovations that ultimately define contemporary dance as we know it today. Martha Graham was an American choreographer who is often credited with popularizing contemporary dance, bringing the form to a worldwide audience over a career spanning seven decades. She's also responsible for developing the Graham technique, which takes its inspiration from breathing cycles and has become an intrinsic part of modern dance forms. Her revolutionary approach to dance paired movement with emotion and her contemporary dance company, which was formed in 1926, still performs today. Other dance legends include Lester Horton, Merce Cunningham, Jose Limon, and the list goes on. So now coming to the dance form itself, contemporary dancers do not use fixed movements and instead try to develop new forms and dynamics such as quick oppositional movements, shifting alignments, expression of raw emotions, systematic breathing, and moves performed in a non-standing position, for example, lying down, which we call as flow work. It also relies on improvisation to bring out the freedom of movement and fluidity, allowing the dancers to explore mind-body connection and in general, trying to find the absolute limits of, the, of our human form and physique, and in doing so, ideally evoke emotion from the audience. Now we'll take a quick look at a section from a short contemporary film called Plume, produced by a leading contemporary dance company from America known as Jacob Jones Dance Company. This was created during the pandemic and filmed globally to bring together 21 dancers. Contemporary dance doesn't have a strict structure. It definitely has multiple layers. And one of those layers, as you can guess, is yoga. Physically, those who practice yoga regularly often experience increased flexibility, better muscle tone, strength, higher energy, better circulatory health, and injury protection, amongst others. On a mental side, the discipline of regular yoga helps manage stress. So it's safe to say that contemporary dance and yoga can go hand in hand. So if you take a look at these images, you can notice that there are more similarities than differences between the two. The left and the right images being yoga asanas, the top and the bottom being contemporary dance poses. Now moving on, now that we know the development of contemporary dance was through the pioneers, let's take a look at how yoga and contemporary dance can go hand in hand through the work of a contemporary dance legend, Martha Graham, who was definitely trained in yoga and implemented it into her dance training. For Graham, life away from dance was impossible. She was choreographing dance till the age of 90, right before she passed. It's nearly impossible to track the influence of her. She is universally understood to be the 20th century's most important dancer, the mother of modern dance. Martha Graham's impact on dance has been compared to that of Picasso's on painting, Stravinsky's on music, and Frank Lloyd Wright's on architecture. So what was her connection with yoga? She was a student at Denny Sean's school, founded by Saint Ruth St. Denis and Ted Sean. In the school, they had two spaces reserved for their classes, an indoor studio and an outdoor space for yoga and meditation practice. In a biography of Graham, her student Agnes DeMille writes that every class began with the class seated cross-legged in yoga position, performing deep breathing exercises that were centered very low in the pelvis. 
According to another student, Stodell, she would sit on the floor for hours trying to discover the movement path that a simple act of breathing takes. So after some digging, I managed to gather some clippings from Graham's technique class just to show the influence of yoga in her teachings. That's a yoga As asana. You see, you can the body is capable of almost endless variations and combinations once it is trained. I spotted a camel pose there if anyone has seen that asana before. All right, another one. Magical first equipment of a dancer, the lovely straight back and the pliable body. And it's what is known as a contraction and out of it, they stretch into a release. The contractions and release are simply the dramatization in body form of the process of breathing. It's the first and the last thing we do. The contraction is letting the breath out. This is taking the breath in. And the contraction is letting the breath out. While it is not used exactly on the breath, the body is used as an instrument of breath rather than the actual breathing exercise. So in these videos, if you observe the shapes her dancers are making with their body, you may notice a similarity, like I said, with certain yoga asanas. And she's very much incorporated breathing into her movement as well as we saw in the second clip. Okay, so seeing what we have seen so far, um, I think we can say that in contemporary dance, our body is the most essential tool. A dancer's body is in constant demand for hours a day, sometimes even seven days a week. All the rigorous training and hours go into building the strength, flexibility, endurance, and resilience of the physical body to be able to constantly perform at our maximum capacity. So during the one year diploma I completed at Atakari Center for Movement Arts, we would be at the studio from 7 a.m. all the way up until 9 p.m. for months in a row, only because that kind of dedication towards building our physical self was a part of the journey to becoming professional dancers. Therefore, in order to be able to maintain and protect this vital tool, our body, we need to make sure we take care of it constantly. So I have a quick question for all those who are listening. As dancers, if we are unable to maintain the functionality of our body, what do you think will happen? As you guessed, while the role of a professional dancer can vary from teaching to performing, most dancers seem to have one thing in common, and that's injury. Like any other sport, the physical demands of dance can sometimes result in occasional harm to the body. This is where yoga can play an important role in supporting the physical body, but also can be used as a form of injury management. So if you take a look at this table, for this, we can classify injuries into two, the injuries that happen in the physical body, and injuries that can happen in the mental body. So starting with the physical body, there are three types of preventative care. The first one, primary prevention, is related to avoiding an injury in the future where no injury has occurred yet. Secondary prevention is decreasing the impact of an existing injury for faster recovery from the current injury episode. And tertiary prevention is related to decreasing the likelihood of re-injury after recovery, basically learning from the past injury. And again, as we can guess, yoga can be used as a tool for all three types of preventative care. When you practice yoga, you are tapping into your internal self to bring awareness to your body and how it's feeling. And this isn't something we focus on as dancers when we are drilling out combinations and repeatedly running through choreographies. It'll provide strength to the weaker areas of your body, as well as release tension from parts that you may not even know that you're carrying tension. Yoga is a good fit for addressing physiological coping mechanisms, improving cardiovascular endurance, and maintaining a dancer's physical aesthetic. Not only the physical body, as we can see, even the mental body needs care and support. Only then can they function harmoniously. It's only normal that dancers put themselves through immense pressure. At times, it comes from being scared of being left behind and fellow dancers gaining an advantage from it. 
And at times it's a competition with the self to always be peaking in our abilities. And this is where yoga can once again be used as a tool for healing and maintaining the peace of mind. How? By using the breath. In yoga, the breath is called prana and is a part of every yoga practice. How can it help with the mental stress for dancers? So as we know, yoga is a non-competitive physical activity that focuses on being conscious of our internal and external self. It's all about using the breath, focusing on the self with mindful movements. So when dancers practice yoga asanas and pranayama on a regular basis, it can help them to develop concentration, focus, release stress, and even avoid stress. Since yoga encourages a non-competitive and accepting attitude towards the self, this compassionate way of approaching the physicality will be helpful during times of injury. Therefore, yoga creates an enhanced mental and bodily awareness that can allow us to move more freely and clearly improving our skills as a dancer. In turn, this will open more doors to creativity and growth as a dancer, finding that we have very less limitations. Okay, so now that we have spoken so much about dance and movement and yoga, I think we need to take a quick moment to move ourselves. So I invite all of you to participate with me in a demo. Great, so if I could ask um, Ishwarya, Priya, Tim to join me with their videos. Great, and all of you as well. Um, so what we're going to do is experiment how the breath and movement can be connected and how that feels for the self, okay? So for the first one, we can go together, okay? Everyone ready? All right, so making sure you have space to your sides. Could you open out your arms? So now, as we know, there's only two ways we breathe in and then we breathe out, right? So we're going to actually relax your arms. I think I made them take you, take it up too fast. So we are going to focus on using the inhalation with expanding and exhalation with contracting, okay? So that's the first experiment we're going to do. Now we may open out our arms, okay? As you inhale, you're going to open out your arms behind. So breathe in, open, expand, breathe out and contract. Imagine you're hugging this round beach ball. Contract, contract, contract. One more time, breathe in, open. Breathe out and contract. One last time, breathe in, breathe out. Lovely, relax. Now, this is one way of doing it. Let's try the other way. Let's try to inhale as we contract and exhale as we expand, okay? So starting with the arms wide, the same movement that we just did, we're going to inhale on the spot because we need to exhale as we, sorry, we're gonna inhale as we contract, exhale as we open, right? Let's go. Inhale and contract, exhale to open. <laughs> I can see some confused faces. Inhale to contract, Exhale to open, right, relax. Now, I would like you to take a quick second to reflect on how both these felt for you in your mind and body, all right? And do we have another minute? May I do one more tiny experiment? Great, so the next one we're gonna experiment is with gathering and throwing, or let's say gathering and releasing, right? So in this, for this demo, I will show it to you once and then we can do it together once again. So we are going to do this movement with our arms. We're going to gather and then release. Okay, this is just the movement, gather and release. Now, we're gonna add our breath to it. As we gather, you're going to breathe in. As you release, you're going to breathe out. All right, now we'll do it together. We'll combine the to the breath and the movement, let's go. Arms ready, breathe in, gather, breathe out, release. Breathe in, 
and breathe out, release. Relax. Wonderful. I love how we're all in sync. <laughs> now, again, as you can expect, we're going to reverse it. Trust me, when I was trying to do this, it was really hard. So I'm going to try now with you guys. We're going to breathe in on the spot, okay? So we can breathe out together and breathe in to release. So breathe out together, breathe in to release. All right, now let's do it. Let's do it together. We breathe in on the spot. Breathe out together. Breathe in to release. Breathe out together. Breathe in to release. And relax. Okay, you can go one more round. Yes. So again, take a quick second and see how that felt for your body. And I think this practical approach will be able to, uh, will allow you to connect the dots on how we as dancers can use the breath with movement to our benefit and how yoga is a nice topping to allow that to really happen, you know, because as dancers, sometimes we, we forget to breathe in the kind of pressure and the tension that we go through in and out of the studio as well. We're on the stage, we're in the studio. We feel that sometimes. So with the help of yoga and connecting the breath to movement, we can see that it's going to be a really big advantage for dancers as well as humans in general. So Ishwarya, can I please invite you back on um, to the screen so you can conclude on our behalf? Thank you so much, uh, Varsha. It was uh, quite tough actually to do the, the opposite of what we naturally feel uh, our breathing should be. <clears throat> So now we've come to the conclusion of our presentation, attuning to the self through creative movement. And uh, we have uh, covered various topics in the, in the classical world and in the contemporary world. And basically um, the practice of dance and yoga on the individual gives us glimpses time and again of possibilities of existence that are beyond the scope of our limited um, imaginations. So it keeps, it keeps taking us uh, to a higher and higher state of being. And which begs the question, is there more with each, with each performance? I think it's safe to say, yes, uh, there is more. And uh, you know, attuning to the self, attuning to that which is infinite becomes a, a sort of very easy path for a dancer or a yoga practitioner uh, through the building of, of all of these uh, sort of qualifications, whether it irrespective of the genre of dance, whether it's contemporary or classical, uh, the training and the lifestyle lends itself for us to be able to achieve this end uh, should we seek it. So thank you so much, um, Priya. Thank you so much, uh, Sudhaji and Tim also for helping us with all of this and Osher Mini Med School for, for having us and for making us explore this topic, not just for you, but for ourselves as well. Uh, it's been a journey. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much. Very well thank said, Ashley. <laughs> yeah. Guys, that was that was fantastic. Um, I, I, you know, just to give a glimpse of like kind of what I was taking from this, you know, with the beginning, we learned kind of going back to our very first lecture, those of you who are there, you know, we talked a lot about what the what the Vedas were, what Vedanta is, and how yoga is a spiritual practice. It is, it is elevating the, the, the person, elevating the person beyond the idea of um, the physical body or the physical mind. It's unifying that self with the universal. And it's just, you know, it was always very interesting to me that even within these texts, they give so much information, which was the, which is that text, the Nadia Shastra, about how all types of arts can be used as another tool to elevate oneself. And then to see how that has gone from that traditional and classical um, discipline and how that's moved through the years to a more modern discipline, but how it's still used for the same purposes, for still, you know, for still the meditative parts, the, the, um, 
the self mind control parts, the, um, the, the tension control parts, that's been really, really interesting to me. And, you know, I, I am a, I'm not quite at the level of these wonderful ladies, but I am a dancer myself, um, you know, a little lesser extent these days as I work more in a clinic, but I had also learned that, um, at one of the highest levels of performance, the highest levels of a dancer is when they're actually, um, when they're actually, when they actually stop thinking of the movement that they're doing and the movement simply just embodies through them. I've always learned that that's the highest level of performance. And it's almost like when, you know, they say when we're, when we're in meditation, the time or the moment that you actually stop having to put effort and you, you're simply just being, it's simply coming through you. That is when you're actually meditating and that's when you're actually attaining that level of elevated spirituality or elevated self. Um, and I'm just curious to know, this is my own question to you guys. Um, has that been, you know, I hear this from dancers a lot, that that is their experience. It's almost an out of body experience as they describe their own dance journey or what it is that they love about dance. It's something that many people say that they can't quite put their finger on it. It's very hard to explain, but it definitely feels like an elevation of themselves. And I'm curious to know if that's something that you guys have experienced or have heard other people talk about. Um, so, I mean, I think on a scientific level, when as performers, we, we, you know, we're on stage or we're in the midst of creation or doing what we love doing, which is dance, I think there is, there is a, you know, explosion of chemicals in the body that happens and it's, it's undeniable, but it's, it makes you feel like you have reached another plane because we don't feel that with our daily activities and what we do in our daily routine. So it's very easy to distinguish what has happened in, in the internal self when you're in that state. And it's really funny because even if you're doing a piece for 45 minutes or one hour, at that point in time, there is no concept of time because you are in a euphoria. And whatever is happening at that time, there's no space, no time, there's no concept of anything. You are being the most true form of yourself. And I think just being that connected to that self has, gives a feeling of elevation, you know, just attuning. You feel like you've attuned to yourself and that pleasure beats everything else as, you know, as a performer, mover, practitioner. So that's my take on it. Sure, uh, I'll also mention something um, similar to what Varsha said. Basically, um, when you're a dancer, you are overcome with love for the art. And uh, that is something that, you know, in spite of, there are so many, there are a thousand things that can go wrong. Uh, and, but that is not going to ever stop you from doing the next show because of this intense love. And it's something very unique to a dancer. Um, you know, once you have it, you, you cannot let it go. And the, uh, and the art also doesn't let you go. So it is this, you know, this interrelationship between yourself and the art, and you're always connected to it. And uh, this connection becomes stronger and stronger because in the performative uh, experience, you have, uh, like Varsha mentioned, you reach a higher state of consciousness because your ability to be meditative and to be one with the role and to be one with, uh, you know, the, the, the drama or the dance, the character, the music, the mood, whatever it is that you're trying to, uh, to show in the performance, you no longer, it's no longer you and the performance. It's no longer the performer and that which is performed. There is only one thing left. And uh, Natya Shastra defines that as rasa or rasananda. And it is the uh, aesthetic experience. And that is also something that's universal. So, you know, if you eat something, if you eat something that gives you this, ah, uh, you know, where you have just, you're, you're just no longer aware of yourself because it's just the taste of that delicious food. Or you watch a movie and, it makes you cry like a baby, but at the end of it, you're so happy because you became one with the film and had a total release 
of yourself and your emotion and your own self-identity. And uh, this is something that we are so privileged as, as dancers to experience um, all the time. <laughs> such a beautiful, beautiful description that both of you gave um, of how profoundly um, the, connect, the, the connection is between this aesthetic of dance and this journey, you know, towards the inner self and, and really becoming one, you know, with that greater sense of self. So thank you both for this incredible, um, very profound and comprehensive um, introduction that you gave all of us uh, today in terms of the connection between yoga and dance. Um, I had a, one, one question that sort of popped to mind actually, Ashwarya, while you were speaking, I think, but I think it would um, absolutely be something I'd love to hear from you as well, Varsha, which is that um, in, in this yoga tradition, um, you know, there's a lot of emphasis, especially in the Patanjali's yoga tradition, there's a lot of emphasis on discipline, you know, and really being able to uh, sort of like manage and control not only the mind, but the body and really allow the mind and body to become vehicles for a deepening of consciousness so that, you know, so that we can really um, uh, come to a connection, you know, with this sort of deeper self that you two are both uh, speaking of. Um, but in that process, in that process, I could also see how there may be a way that the orientation to the body is one in which perhaps there's not as much potentially compassion or care or kindness in theory from a disciplinarian standpoint um, that one could have towards the body. And I'm just wondering if both of you could like speak to how you maintain some kind of balance there, or how you look at you know the orientation to the body so that it doesn't become it doesn't become seen as like a, a prison to transcend, you know, because that's also an issue when we, when we look at our body punitively, when we don't look at it as something that is our friend that's along with us for this lifelong journey. So there are actually uh, two sutras that come to mind when you mention this. The first one is with respect to uh, practice, abhyasa. So Patanjali says, um, so meaning abhyasa or practice is that which requires a lot of effort and uh, consistency. He, he then later on says it has to be consistent. Um, it has to be done over a long period of time and it has to be done with an attitude of devotion. So uh, it is something, uh, practice is something which is very um, rigorous, but at the same time, he says, prayatna uh, shaitilyam ananta samapatibhyam. So one achieves that uh, ananta or that feeling of the happiness or the feeling of that limitlessness when you release the effort. So it is not that you are abusing the body. So never in an asana practice are you abusing the body. You are always, it, it, asana practice is not uh, where you force yourself and, uh, you know, it's not, it's not that kind of a training. So you put yourself into a particular posture and then you have to release, you have to learn to release. And uh, I don't mean release in terms of yin yoga or, or something like that, not specific, but, be, uh, you know, BK Sayangar, uh, the great yoga teacher, he uses a lot of props. So that is so that, uh, you know, the prop aids you and if the asana is difficult, but if it is, it, it also challenges you. Um, so it is something you have to treat your body with care. And uh, Padma Subramaniam has, had also mentioned, you know, you train the body in order to forget it. So it is not an abuse, it is, it is a care. And uh, even though you do, you may push some boundaries, but it has to be done. If it's a yoga practice, it has to be done in a very uh, gentle manner. Otherwise it's not yoga. Yeah, so I mean, I'm gonna take from the last thing that you said, um, which is as practitioners of movement, as much as we would think that we rely only on this physical body that we have, I think through practice and training, after going through that rigorous training and practice to achieve what 
what you need to do to be a professional in that field. I think as a mover, one thing we learn as a takeaway through the whole experience is we are actually not the body, nor are we the mind. You know, we are way, way more than that. We're way beyond that. So through this practice, we tend to realize that we need to detach ourselves from this instrument that we have come into in this current, you know, point in this earth right now. So the only way that we can find peace through like injuries or like you said, you know, pushing ourselves and, you know, almost abusing our physical body. I think to us, we don't associate it as our body. It almost comes with this detachment of there is no limit and we are going to try to really, um, we're going to try to really, you know, and compass that knowledge into our system that it's, we don't need to rely on the body to be able to do what we're doing. It's about just believing that we are so much more than that. So whatever happens to the physical body through injury, in a way, we shouldn't really be too, um, we shouldn't be too hurt or we shouldn't be too upset about it because that's not our limit, right? So I think I, as a, a performer, always tend to tell myself, it's okay if I get injured, it's okay if I need to push myself because this is not my limit. And there is always ways in which I can find tools to recover, but at the same time, you know, not rely too heavily on this instrument at the end of the day. I don't know if that made sense. But, but how do you do, Varsha? How do you find that point at which you push yourself so hard that it does become actually something that you are not caring for your body any longer, but you're actually setting yourself up for injury? So I'm curious how you find that balance point. I think so when, when, you, you, know, when you face injuries uh, to some level, I think more than the body itself, you face a lot of tension in your mind right and it's very interconnected the body and mind so to be able to feel a sense of I'm not feeling this pain anymore you need to not feel the pain in your mind right so I think the starting point comes from trying to heal your mind which then can heal the body and that's actually very easy because I mean I can even take uh, Priya into this when we were doing a training right I think there were there were around 40 to 60 people in a studio, but consistently there would be 10 to 15 people just sitting out because of injury, right? They would just be not able to perform because of something that they're going through mentally or physically as an injury. And um, once you sit on the sidelines and you experience both, right? You start to realize you cannot really get attached to what happens with you you really need to be able to transcend higher than that in order to accept the shortcomings and the whole um, pain and the pleasures of this whole thing. So as much as we enjoy the pleasures and the highs of being performers, I think we also equally need to accept the shortcomings of being performers as well, which is this. So because we feel so grateful to be in this all the time when we're experiencing something like a low or something so negative, I think we ourselves try to kind of bridge that gap through understanding that this is what we want to do and this is part of the process. So that acceptance with oneself and one's um, profession and love for the craft is what kind of acts as a band-aid for the situation, you know, which makes it easier to get through all of that. That's a, that's a beautiful description of that, Varsha. I wanted to add one thing um, just that came to my mind, especially because I've been in that place of being that person that has been injured as well. And I've seen, seen other places where um, injury does occur. And I think when I'm sitting here thinking about it, I think it comes to a self-understanding if what you're doing in that moment is coming from a place of ego and goal orientation versus a place of, for lack of a better word, heart and trying to elevate and transform. And it's very often that one is cut when one is practicing or trying to push themselves in a place that's coming more from ego and attachment to a certain goal. That is where I think people often push themselves to the point of injury. And um, if you are play, if you are really 
coming at it from a yogic perspective, oftentimes you are really attuning into your own self and even the subtleties within the body. You know, people who are very well versed in yoga can start to understand when maybe an injury is going is is more prone to happen prior to it even happening. But when you're coming from a place of, I must do this, I have to get there where I'm nobody or something like that, that's when it starts to push into a, a different realm. And I almost think that that's a less transformative dance experience. Um, this is something that I was just thinking about as you guys were talking, you know, it's very interesting to see that the the original classical dance came directly from, right, directly from this spiritual development. And dancers used to dance in temples, right? They used to dance um, as part of rituals, as part of singing songs, as part of, of these spiritual um, uh, traditions. And then, you know, dance at some point, I don't know when, and I'm, I'm not giving a very good history, this is broad generalizations here, but at some point, it definitely took off into one realm that was very achievement focus that was very audience focus that was very how many tickets can we sell focused right how can we become the best at something the most entertaining at something um and it's when you get into that realm of dance which is a which is a practical part that dancers have to deal with these days because that's how we put you know that's how they put food on the table for themselves which is something that's constantly grappling with just as Every human grapples with something like that in their life, right? Balancing those two. But it's with that, that part of it where we develop lots of dancers that may have developed, um, be, to be completely frank and coming from a medicine perspective, you know, dance is very well known in the medicine world to a dancer goes along with many um, psychosocial issues, things like anorexia, things like body dysmorphia many of these issues working through things like fractures and these types of things but there seems to be as the whole world seems to be sort of looking more towards bringing their whole life back to a more balanced more spiritual more elevated experience even the dance world is doing the same things you'll actually see contemporary dance came out um it was almost a rejection of ballet in some sorts that they didn't want such a rigid experience and they're trying to go back to this more self-transformative experience and you'll even see come sort of a very physical perspective when you go to the the traditional classical dancers and the contemporary dancers you're going to see people of all sorts of shapes and sizes and there's not one perfect body type it is inclusive of all different types and so i'd say that there's definitely a divergence between the um the the commercialized dance forms which have which have really taken over and we see a lot of and the the original sort of purpose and usually people's love for dance, which comes from that self-transformative experience. Varsha and Aishwarya, thank you so much, both of you, for zooming in from India. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of it. Thank you yeah. so much.